with great pleasure that I'd like to invite uh, Professor Mike Wright onto the stage. Please welcome Mike Wright. Thank you. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, I've got to follow it now, that's the problem. Uh, I'm uh, very pleased to be here. I'm not this first time at this conference. Um, most conferences I go to, I sometimes get stuck with the, um, what they call the graveyard slot, which is a slot after lunch normally. I'm, I'm very pleased to see that with this being an innovation conference, that the graveyard slot has now moved to the first thing on a Friday morning after the, the night before. So uh, I'll try to uh, keep you awake. And, uh, uh, and what I want to do is kind of uh, elaborate on some issues to do with uh, university entrepreneurship uh, and where I think it's heading, um, and hopefully that might stimulate a few questions. So, just kind of as a nutshell, we've seen over the last few years um, a lot of academic spin-offs, some of which have been successful. Here are some uh, names that may be familiar to you, uh, even if uh, the screen is chopping them off on, on the one I can see. But uh, these are some cases where they floated on the stock market or been sold at quite a large prices. But uh, what we see is, I think, uh, a quite a changing environment in universities. Uh, I think what's been expected of universities, uh, both in education terms but commercialization terms, is changing, uh, is widening, more is expected. We have politicians making statements about um, what universities should be doing. And well, I think as a result of that, we're seeing new forms of university entrepreneurship emerging. So this, that raises a number of implications about how universities and industry and corporations can, can meet those challenges. Uh, so I think we're at a juncture um, where we should perhaps reassess how entrepreneurship is viewed in, in universities uh, and how we might think about continuing to stimulate it in the future. And I'm aware, I believe, that there are I think, 61 countries represented here. So I think some of these issues, um, whilst they're already mature in some countries, are issues that are starting to develop elsewhere. So maybe for those of you from environments where university entrepreneurship is newer, may actually learn some extra lessons and maybe leapfrog some of the issues we've had to deal with. So what I want to do is just say a little bit about where I think we are in terms of university entrepreneurship, and then talk about what I think is the features of the emerging landscape, hence the landscape of the Pyrenees uh, and the, the opening slide. So it seems to me that I want to talk about issues about why this is happening, what is happening in terms of emerging landscape, who's doing it, and how universities may be able to effectively stimulate it and then think about where we go from here in the next decade. So if I think about where we are and where academic entrepreneurship has been traditionally developing, then I think a lot of it has been to do with a broad aim to generate financial returns directly from spin-offs, from licensing, patenting, consultancy. And a lot of this has been focused on academic faculty, uh, and postdocs, and a lot of it's been conducted through technology transfer officers, science parks, and uh, out the back door, as some, some might call it. But if we actually look at what's been happening to the trend in those activities, uh, which hopefully you can see on this slide, and uh, again, as this is an innovation conference, I don't just have one zapper, I have to have two. Uh, which is uh, a, a novel innovation. So this is UK data, but I think you can get a similar pattern from elsewhere. Uh, there's three, four lines here. So the top one relates to the top quartile of universities in the UK down to the bottom quartile. And what I've got is data on spin-offs from 2000 through to 2014. And even for those of you who had too much dancing last night, um, you can probably see that there's a downward trend in, in spin-offs from the top quartile universities in particular. Uh, other universities, it's fairly flat, but by and large, the trend of activities where most of it was happening is actually downward. 
So we're actually seeing fewer spin-offs, but perhaps a flight to quality. If we actually look at what happens to these spin-offs, on my earlier slide, I had some examples of spin-offs that have been very successful, that are IPO'd or, or were sold. Then, in terms of the actual numbers, very few of these spin-offs do actually float. There's one or two isolated instances, but most of them don't really go anywhere. A lot of them fail. So whilst we may promote the spin-offs as an interesting idea to generate income, in, in reality, there's not a lot of it happening. And in terms of licensing revenue, we know that's very skewed. And there are big issues to do with raising venture capital and to do with the right kind of mix of expertise of expertise within technology transfer offices. And we also know that that effect of entrepreneurship in universities is actually quite different dep depending on whether we're talking about the top quartile or top echelon or what we might call mid-range universities. We, recent work, again, on the UK, but I think it applies worldwide, shows that we mustn't get carried away with the notion that all universities are going to create world-leading spin-off companies. Entrepreneurship in universities can very much involve knowledge transfer, research transfer, consultancy, and so on. And for mid-range universities, evidence suggests that that's where much of the contribution is going to be. The top echelon universities or quartile, top quartile universities is perhaps where a lot of the spin-off activity will have most impact. And if we actually look at what's going on in universities in terms of their ability to uh, support spin-off and entrepreneurial activities, we can see that that's quite varied. Okay. So uh, this chart basically shows that there are different models of academic entrepreneurship that are quite effective. So some universities may have a lot of spin-offs, but they're really f local consultancy type businesses through to kind of world leading incubator led spin offs. Okay. But what we actually find is a lot of universities trying to do uh, entrepreneurial activities don't really have the resources or competencies to do it. So this, this is something we like to do, but we don't really have the resources to do it. And so they've got kind of suboptimal approaches. And although this study was done a few years ago, a very recent study we've done shows that this, still this problem, this issue still persists. So there's a kind of a mismatch between objectives and aims to try to get significant gains from spin-off activity and the ability to do it. And I think that's driving some of the developments that I'll talk about in a few minutes. So as my mentor said, uh, and uh, Bob Dylan, whose um, birthday was uh, last week, um, 75th birthday was last week, he's not dead, although some people think that's the case. Uh, Bob Dylan's not dead, he, he just sings that way. And uh, what, what, is it, what he, as you know, he said the times are changing, and I said that as a believer, I have to say, um, so, um, is that the times are changing. So I think what we're seeing is this kind of traditional entrepreneurship focus, which is kind of this link between research and third mission. So research-driven spin-offs, creating um, entrepreneurial gains from the lab, if you like. But I think what we're seeing is a move towards a kind of a broader approach, not just instead of, but in addition to that approach, where there's a link between teaching and alumni interrelations and the third mission. So this kind of entrepreneurial gains from the teaching side of things is becoming more, more important, and that's coming, being seen through student entrepreneurship and graduate entrepreneurship. So I think we're starting to see this evolution of, of a new model of entrepreneurship in universities. And that's what I want to start to focus on. Why is that happening? Well, I already touched on the, the situation uh, where stakeholders, particularly government, but also industry, are demanding uh, kind of this wider social and economic benefit from universities. And that's 
resulting in kind of competitive pressure and benchmarking of university performance, pressure to generate funds from private sources, which perhaps has always been the case in the US and the UK, perhaps less so in many other university contexts, but I think that's starting to, to become even more important in the US and the UK. So we're starting to see student entrepreneurship and commercialization funds raised by industry. And there's some examples of universities. We're starting to see different ways of commercialization and resourcing, and perhaps a more strategic approach, because rather than having a strategy based on formal IP being converted into spin-offs, it's more about informal IP, private and social benefits, not just private benefits, but also issues about ownership and open source access. So the whole set of issues to do with what's commercializable uh, is changing uh, and requiring a different kind of strategic approach. So what that's leading to in the what is both direct and what I would call indirect forms of academic entrepreneurship. So in addition to faculty entrepreneurship, there's a lot we're interested in graduate and employee spin-offs and startups. That's involving an increased diversity of startup types, not just science-based, patent-based spin-offs. It's involving the transfer of knowledge into the curriculum and from which spin-offs are occurring. And this indirect notion of graduates going to work for a couple of years and then spinning off on their employer to create a startup business. Right, so rather than going directly from university to create a spin-off. In addition to that, we're seeing this indirect route. And a study we did based on Swedish data four or five years ago now showed that, in fact, those are the ventures that perform the best compared to those that go directly from university. So here is a very important indirect effect of, of universities. And as I said, we've also seen this growth of formal and informal IP-based university spin-offs, some of which are commercially oriented, some of which are social ventures. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this guy here. I don't know whether this, you can see it very clearly, but, but this is um, the Million Dollar homepage. Uh, and this is a student at Nottingham University who, to fund his uh, studies, decided to create this uh, homepage, and he sold a million pixels on this homepage for a dollar each. Now, the mathematicians will work out amongst you, even at this time in the morning after the night before, that that means a million dollars. Okay? And, and, he, and he managed to, to do that. The last few he sold on eBay, and he actually got over a million. Okay? So, now, it's a very odd and special uh, form of entrepreneurship, but it does show this variety of entrepreneurial activities. And if we think about where that's happening, not just in terms of odd examples, what we see from UK data is that there's this enormous growth in graduate entrepreneurship activities. Right? B businesses started by graduates. You can see over the 12, 13 year period since 2001, the number of these per year is quite enormous. Compare that to the numbers I had earlier for the faculty spin-offs, which are relatively few. Numerically, these things are much larger. And what we also know from uh, GEMDATA, the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor data, that these are businesses that have got a much stronger growth aspiration compared to startups generally in the economy. Okay? So these things are numerically pretty big. And if I put a start number in front of you, 20 to 1. 20 to 1 is not the, the odds on Jose Mourinho being fired by Manchester United in September. Uh, probably rather shorter odds than that. 20 to 1 is the number of graduate startups compared to faculty startups per year. So in terms of the importance of this as a phenomenon, it's not just something peripheral. It's a very important part of 
university activities in entrepreneurship. And if I try to look at that to internationally, uh, the, the date is a bit messy because the, the data series are a little bit uh, broken up. So uh, forgive me if it looks a bit, um, a bit like spaghetti hoops. Um, I've just taken five countries just to show variety. Um, but what we see is the blue line is the UK. This kind of reddish line is the US. This kind of gray line is Argentina. The gap there is, is because the, the, the survey wasn't conducted then. Because, uh, the yellowish one is China, similar kind of issue. And Italy's down here. So the point about this is that um, in the US and UK, we're seeing probably somewhere around 10% of firms a year, startups per year, are involving graduates. Uh, in some other emerging economies, then that's a much higher, although it's jumping around quite a lot, on average, the numbers are much higher. So gra graduate entrepreneurship in emerging economies seems to me very important. In Italy, it seems to me, again, this is a gap in the data, in Italy, the, the, the percentage is much lower. So there is some variation across countries in the way this is occurring. But I think it, it, this kind of emphasizes this notion that graduates are not just about training folks to go into corporations, but increasingly are offering entrepreneurial options, particularly in emerging economies where there may be important growth demands. Okay. Now, moving on from that to some issues about who is engaging in this activity, I think what we're seeing is as this activity expands, then we get a number of challenges for the various stakeholders. So one of the big demands or challenges relates to the role of universities in society. Because what I think we're seeing is a, an issue to do with private profits for universities and entrepreneurs versus wider social benefits. Okay. So issues to do with do universities aim to engage in licensing programs that maximize income or maximize social benefits? So for example, UC Berkeley are actually looking at a program where they focus on socially responsible licensing rather than the purely direct financial returns. And that kind of emphasizes this indirect benefit to universities. Secondly, is uh, how, what are the implications of this for academics? Because clearly there are a number of issues here. First of all, to do with what happens with academics who create a business, get venture capital, and potentially have conflicts between their home institution and performing for the venture capital firm. And that's not been resolved yet. A wider issue perhaps more pertinent even, is how do we encourage academics to do this within the tenure and promotion system? How do we actually deal with it in terms of cases where we want them to publish research, we want them to get good teaching evaluations, but at the same time we say we want you to engage in commercialization? In the US, apparently, only about 16 universities have explicitly brought this into tenure and promotion decisions. In the UK, for those of you who are not in the UK, lucky you, um, we have this research excellence framework, which is a five-year exercise that looks at research by each academic in each department in each university. And it's only in the, the last exercise where we introduced recognition of commercialization, entrepreneurship, as part of the assessment. And there's always this conflict between encouraging academics to do it, but at the same time saying, well, how does that count for the ref? For example, uh, as, as Todd mentioned, I, I've been directing the Centre for Management Buyout Research, and I've been doing that for 30 years. It was only in 2013 that the work I was doing for that actually started to count for the ref. Right? So, uh, and, and so I was doing it for perhaps other personal reasons, but from a, a performance monitoring point of view, it was, it was almost irrational. And I think that's a wider issue that we've, we're only just beginning to face. 
Other issues to do with who concern how we get the right expertise in technology transfer office personnel, because as we're moving beyond purely licensing towards entrepreneurship, student entrepreneurship, and so on, then that raises issues to do with the kind of expertise that those folks have to be able to stimulate entrepreneurship. Student and graduate entrepreneurship issues to do with ownership of IP, uh, shared ownership, and so on. Even within universities, disciplines have different approaches to entrepreneurship. And therefore, how do we actually stimulate that? We may not be able to do it directly from the top of the university because each department may have discretion, but yet it may undermine the whole university performance if we don't address that. And then if you like, at the apex of the university, the university council, the university board, how does that governance structure stimulate, develop and monitor entrepreneurship in universities? Have we got the right kind of composition of the boards and councils to be able to do that? Uh, and if not, how do we construct it? Because if we don't, we're going to get this mismatch exacerbated between our intention, our aim to create entrepreneurship in universities and our ability to deliver. Now, what I think this leads towards is um, another diagram, and so I'm academic, I have to have a diagram, otherwise I, I don't feel very well. So what it seems to me is kind of conceptually or schematically, what we think need to think about developing is an ecosystem, partly because ecosystem is the word of the, of the year, so we have to get that into any presentation, but also more seriously is that we need to start to see what are the parts that we need to fit together. And it seems to me that within universities to encompass this broader scope of entrepreneurship, we need to be thinking of some kind of activity continuum, I'll call it. From what I would say from a pre-incubator or pre-accelerator community, very early stage approach, through to what we more traditionally think of as an incubator, which also then is connected to outside the university. And that needs to bring in various entrepreneurs, it needs to bring in support mechanisms, it needs to bring in investors. And that is going to be affected by the context of the university, it's going to be affected by the local and external context, and it's not static, it's going to evolve over time. Right? And if we want to kind of really kind of see how complex that is, then under this new framework, then we need to bring in all these different stakeholders, different sorts of entrepreneurs, different sorts of support mechanisms, you can see them there, different sorts of investors. So rather than just perhaps VCs and business angels, rather than just um, the technology transfer office, rather than just faculty, then there are these other actors in the system that we need to develop links with. And the way we develop those links is going to depend on the kind of university we're talking about, whether it's, um, uh, if you like, a, a top quartile, mid-range, mid whether it's a, a broad-based or a narrow-based university. So like for, Imperial is a, is a very focused uh, university. It doesn't really have um, arts and social science, apart from the business school. Um, and so on. Okay? And it also depends on the policy context in which we're operating. Okay? So rather than this kind of one-size-fits-all, then we have this rather more complex, uh, fine-tuned, fine if you will, method that we need to develop. Okay? So for example, uh, of some of the, uh, to give you an example just from Imperial, um, some of the things at this pre-accelerator phase, you know, we have Imperial Innovations, uh, which is a later, later stage, but we also have um, a couple of things, a couple of examples, what we call Imperial Launchpad, which is a, <clears throat> an event where we, at the end of the academic year, or towards the end of the academic year, we take students who've been developing their business projects, so these are not just business plans, they are live business projects, and we meet them together with accelerators, angels, and so on. Um, 
and they can present, present to them. We also have Imperial Create Lab, which is a kind of a, an ongoing community throughout the year where students with ideas and even postdocs with ideas can bring them together and collaborate to, to try to shape up their idea into something that can start to be ready to go to a real accelerator or to start to attract funding. And that, that, that is actually connected to Imperial Innovation. So we have that link between the pre-accelerator and the accelerator. And you can see there the numbers involved in that. This is not just um, a handful of students. This is large numbers uh, and pretty large books. Uh, and so thinking about where we're taking this forward, then I think, that how does this relate to thinking the role of the university? Well, I think what I'd like to see it as is trying to tease out somewhere between the myth and the reality. In the sense, on the one hand, we may think about entrepreneurial universities creating vast amounts of revenue from entrepreneurial activities. Well, hopefully from what I've shown, some of that is not really happening, and there are reasons why that's not happening. On the other hand, are we moving completely away from the traditional university concept of a research-driven university? Some of the debate, it seems to me, about entrepreneurial universities seems to suggest we should ditch the traditional university and focus on the entrepreneurial university. Well, it seems to me that actually these are complementary rather than substitutes. Why? Well, I think it comes down to issues to do with what is the purpose of research in universities? What's distinctive about it rather than being pure private consultancy? Well, perhaps we should recall a couple of well-known folks in... Uh, in academia, but who've translated across to policy and practice. John Maynard Keynes said, the problems of the future can't be dealt with simply by applying the solutions of the past, because the problems of the future are different from the problems of the past. And Kurt Lewin, going way back into the 1950s, said, there's nothing so practical as a good theory. So in other words, if we just rely on practice, what we've been doing, then we actually we may not have the right tools to, to solve innovating problems of the future. So we do need this kind of blue sky academic research, but we need to find ways of connecting it to practice. So what I'd like to argue for is that we need this twin track of direct and indirect academic entrepreneurship. The direct academic entrepreneurship is stemming from this novel research, maybe starting at Blue Sky, but leading to interaction with practice. And that can be quite difficult. I remember when I first started looking at management buyouts in 1981, my head of department told me as a very junior faculty member that I was wasting my academic career on this. Um, kind of 35 years later, four, four million pounds later, I'm still wasting my academic career on it. So there are certain hurdles that one has to get over, but actually there are longer term benefits. And secondly, I think we need to develop this indirect academic entrepreneurship. Using education and research to indirectly stimulate entrepreneurship through CSOs, corporate spin-offs, that is, university graduates going to work and then becoming entrepreneurs, or creating alumni startups. So that's about encouraging entrepreneurial skills development at the student level, through the garages, through the pre-accelerators, and through industry interactions by bringing industry into to those formats. And I think it's also about supporting embedding entrepreneurship within the regions, within the locality of the university. We're just doing some work at the minute extending the Swedish work, which shows that the extent of graduate entrepreneurship is strongest where there are local peers engaged in entrepreneurship, and also where the entrepreneur, there's an entrepreneurial family 
also in that locality. Okay? So that kind of emphasizes this important role of the university in stimulating the entrepreneurial local ecosystem. I think it's also about, rather than ditching past trajectories, is actually building on those trajectories. So it's kind of taking the legacy of where the university is coming from, rather than shifting to a pure, if you like, entrepreneurial university trajectory. What that means is that different legacies are going to lead to different ways in which entrepreneurship is adopted, is adapted, and implemented in universities. So you, so you may get two universities in a particular, in re, in a, within, within a particular region or in adjacent regions, but actually, even though they're perhaps research-oriented, they've come from slightly different trajectories. And the way in which they frame that for future entrepreneurship research can be quite different. So if I, if I take, for example, some work we've been recently doing, we have one university in the West Midlands of the UK and one in the East Midlands, both established f at least um, in the first half of the 20th century, both what we might call research-oriented universities, but the way in which they've framed that history in terms of developing their entrepreneurial offering is actually quite different. Okay? So it emphasizes the way in which it's difficult to just um, switch wholesale from one tradition to another. So finally, just for the, the academics in the audience, I think some of this is not just relating to how one puts these things into practice, but it does relate to issues to do with further research. Because obviously, as academics, we always have to end a paper with further research, because ne we never have an end of research. So Todd's just done his PhD, but that's not the end, mate. That, that's just the beginning. So sorry to disappoint you on that. So it seems to me that there are a number of issues to do with uh, a research agenda. And here's some thoughts, is that um, while we may stimulate entrepreneurship research among students and entrepreneurial activity among students, is how do we actually resource that? And how do we actually move it beyond the creation to ventures that grow and contribute economically? How do we integrate student entrepreneurship with the traditional tech transfer office activities? Are they compatible? How can we make them compatible? How do we reconcile the traditional and entrepreneurial activities of universities? Not just in the aims, but actually how you implement that strategy. It's all very well to, to state the aim, but to implement it is quite difficult. How do we reconcile these conflicts of interest between academic entrepreneurs as faculty and their corporate entrepreneurial involvement? What are the most effective regional mechanisms for graduate entrepreneurship? How does that vary between different regions and different mixes of universities in regions? And perhaps the um, $64,000 question is, uh, how do we actually develop evaluation methods that will actually pick up this diverse activity? You know, it's bad enough trying to measure performance when we just counted spin-offs or counted licenses. But to actually measure these more indirect activities can be quite difficult. It may not be impossible, but it can be difficult, but it's actually going to become essential if we're going to demonstrate that universities are fulfilling the role that increasingly society and politicians and governments are asking of them. So on that note, I'll stop. And thank you for your attention. Um, I wanted to start off the questions if I could. I'm going to hog your time just for a second. Mm -hmm. um, what I wanted to uh, discuss was um, you've talked a little bit about the ecosystem. Obviously, that's being mentioned quite a lot at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned many times uh, the connection with civic or regional society. Mm -hmm. um, and what I wanted to discuss was the role of the academic in that, because um, we've, we've seen f the first mission responsibility of, uni uh, of universities, but of academics, which is education. They've had the second mission added to that 
as their responsibility, which is research. That was a long time ago now. But now it seems as though they're having this third mission or third responsibility uh, mm -hmm. added to their, to their uh, tasks, if you like. So I wanted to ask you, what do you think is realistic to expect from academics in this setting? Well, I think I might even call it a fourth mission now, it, it, because in the Please. sense of it, the third mission, I think, was reaching out commercially through uh, faculty spin-offs and, and li licensing. I think the fourth mission is actually connecting up the, the student and graduate part of it to that, so it's kind of adds an extra dimension. So I, I think there's the role of the academic, let's tell that broadly, I think if it, there's kind of the individual academic through to the, the schools and there's the the university. So I think it has to be kind of a multi-level approach. Uh, so, so I think universities themselves can, can help that through the very high apex in terms of the governance mechanisms, bring it on board. But then as you come down to schools and departments, and I think it's working actively to bring in industry, but also in a two-way approach. So bring in industry, but also bring in alum. So if you, you know, a lot of universities kind of make statements about uh, reaching out to alums, but if you actually look, a lot of them are not very good at it. And I think there's a scope there to, to develop that, uh, because a lot of alums want to come back, not just to hand over lots of money, but they actually want, if they don't want to hand over lots of money, they want to contribute through uh, coaching or teaching or something like that. And I think there's a resource that can be brought into universities. So I think schools, whether it's a business school or an academic department in science and engineering, or, or even in an arts department where you may actually have graduates who've gone to create arts-based businesses, which we sometimes forget, uh, reaching out to them and bringing those in can actually be a very important resource that can actually stimulate this kind of entrepreneurship. So it's a kind of a very kind of micro, fine-grained approach, but I think it's something that can, can do a lot to simulate that. And, and then obviously individual academics can perhaps get involved in that because, uh, just trying to think from my experience with my buyout research center, I could see that as an onerous thing that why do I do it? I don't get paid for it. But actually, it has a two-way benefit. It raises the profile of the research, so we get a lot of impact uh, not just press hits, but we get impact in terms of uh, using our research for lobbying for the European Commission, for the US uh, government uh, audit office, and so on. But also, it's a resource because it gives me data that I can use for research. So I think the more we can emphasize to academics that this is a two-way street, that it will benefit their academic research, then we can square the circle, if I'm not mixing my metaphors, in terms of uh, uh, encouraging and incentivizing academics to do it. Okay. Um, there was another key theme that I picked up in your presentation, which was that uh, we've seen, uh, if you like, a explosion, but then a decrease in academic entrepreneurship, so spin-outs coming from universities. Yeah. Um, we saw that during the 1990s, 2000s, we, we really saw a higher level of focus on this area. Mm -hmm. Now we're seeing in the uh, 2010s, I don't even know how you call that, but the 2010s, yeah. we're seeing... The teenies, I suppose. The I teenies, is it? Okay, <laughs> fantastic. Um, the 2010s, the teenies, um, we're seeing a shift, a dramatic shift to the focus being on the student and student entrepreneurship. Mm. Are we building the same sort of, uh, I don't know if it's a bubble, but are we are being realistic in our expectations of, of students and student entrepreneurship? I think it's a good point. I, I think there's always that question. Uh, there's always going to be something of a bubble. I think there's always this raising of expectations like we did with faculty spin-offs that they're all going to generate multi-billion dollar enterprises. So I think we have to uh, be realistic, but get that balance right between um, stimulating students who, who can be entrepreneurs and who've got good ideas and maybe almost discouraging the ones that that shouldn't be entrepreneurs. I think some of the some of the, we have a, an MSc in innovation entrepreneurship and a lot of students come on that because they want to become entrepreneurs. Uh, but after kind of a, f a few months they realize that they're not really entrepreneurs. Um, that doesn't mean to say they've wasted their their cash. What it means is they they've got some very useful expertise on entrepreneurialism, if you like, that they can take into a corporate environment, but at least uh, they've gone through that process. So I think we need to kind of 
turn, if you like, ro turn rosy glasses into black glasses, as a, a venture capitalist once told me. Um, but also at the same time, we need to reinforce the support mechanisms. So again, like with faculty entrepreneurship, rather than just saying this is a slogan, we need to develop these kind of pre-accelerated garages I talked about, things like that that can help students to, to, to know how to frame the business idea and then to take it forward. So with that, um, we want to throw it to all of you. I'm sure we've got some, uh, some interesting questions um, for Professor Mike Wright. Yep, we've got a question just there. Uh, Alistair Taylor, Royal Society. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation. I was wondering if you do much uh, looking at the role of careers officers at universities. Um, these have also grown quite a lot over the last few years um, and doing a lot of work around um, student entrepreneurship and business engagement and things like that. Um, how well do you think they tie up to the more entrepreneurial end of, traditional entrepreneurial end of the university and the tech transfer and actually faculty who are doing this as well? That's, good, that's a very interesting question. If I think of our, our school, never mind the, the university careers office, if, if I ask our school folks to say, well, how many of our students have become entrepreneurs? There's a kind of a silence at the end of the email for a while. And uh, eventually something comes back saying, we think it may be um, about... Um, so, so I think there's a lot of patchy data even just to log that. Um, I think there's, it's even patchier, I think, that in following through what happens beyond the leaving, you know, because a lot of students leave, won't start up immediately, as we saw, may delay it. So I think that bit's missing, the kind of even the pure logging of it. I think the actual advisory part of the care officer function is also probably lagging, I suspect. Uh, I think it, it may be very patchy, there may be good practice going on in some places, but thinking of where many career officers are coming from, you know, I think there's a, a connection that ought to be made perhaps more with, well, maybe not so much tech, trans, not tech transfer officers, or maybe both need to evolve together to see where connections can be made. Um, I think that's very much a, an early stage process. Uh, but I think that, I think, is a, it, there's a hole in the system, I, in my view. Uh, in that area, because we might be doing things with with students in the not just in the business school, but in a lot of science and engineering departments are putting on courses for particularly post -grad, post grads to to start ventures. But I think at the undergrad level, maybe in the masters level, that, that a lot of that is missing. Yet a lot of this, the drive and stimulus is coming at that level. You know, the, the example I gave of the Nottingham University student, that was an undergrad. Uh, I had an MSc student um, on my innovation entrepreneurship course who got onto an accelerator with a student project. So there's, you know, there's a lot of things going on there that um, careers officers may be able to develop their function uh, to be able to help further and can make that connection. I found that really interesting, actually. Thank you very much. I mean, at Kent, we've been supporting students, staff and alumni since 2004. Um, and we found where it really works is um, a course of training, but also the incubator, having that where they can all um, mix. But you mentioned REF 2014. And of course, we probably need to say 2020, or is it 2021 coming up? And what I've seen at Kent is a real knee-jerk to spin-off startups being included and lots of academics wanting now just to set up a business. And so I've got to put on some training for them about, well, it's not just having a business, it's got to be doing something. But I wondered if you were going to continue your research, because I think it would be really interesting to see on the academic side if the ref and the startup element actually is going to make a difference. Yeah, I think you're right. There is this, there's always this kind of knee-jerk reaction or, uh, you know, if the monitoring says this is what you should be monitored against, well, we'll make sure we do that. So I think that's why we saw this explosion in spin-offs in the early 2000s because, you know, you've got to do spin-offs, right, we'll create businesses. They don't go anywhere. Um, but we'll create a business. So, and I think that the, the danger of that happening with the REF exercise. So, so I think we need, what that may mean is either we need to educate folks that don't just spin off, but also at the same time to filter out those that can grow and say, well, how do we actually support them? And also then have an evaluation mechanism that, that, um, that picks up that, that side of it. 
the effect of it rather than just the creation, which is more difficult because, of course, you have to wait for these things to, to, uh, to start uh, and then to grow. But also, how do you deal with situations where somebody may have a great idea, uh, they invest a lot of effort into it, but then it fails? Because we know a very high percentage of spin-offs, startups fail. So th does that mean that if you start something up and it fails, then you get a one on the, the ref? If you start something up, the IPOs, you get a four. Uh, you know, I think that is not an easy aspect to deal with. So I think there's a lot of work we need to do in working out the best way to evaluate that. Um, but I think that's maybe the way to try and go. But I think the first thing is, is to start to open people's eyes and say, look, it's not just about creating this company off the shelf. It's actually making sure it's going to go somewhere. Yeah. And, and that's something we want to, to look at. We are starting to look at how you actually combine these, these, these measures, these evaluation that is not just kind of a, <clears throat> like the old ref is basically your best four publications, but it's actually an evaluation that's multifaceted, which becomes more, more difficult. Now, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but for those of you not from the United Kingdom, the REF is the Research Excellence Framework that evaluates academics in the It's the kind of yeah. thing that kind of uh, distracts so much attention uh, for five years that uh, you, you do wonder whether the costs are worse than the benefits. Looking forward to it. Uh, other questions? I was interested in the way you started with, uh, it used to be about the focus on commercialization and now all these additional activities need to be thought about. I wanted to reflect back to you that um, a lot of people are conceptualizing this as actually entrepreneurship is a very broadly defined term and commercialization is just one of the many activities that people are involved in. But uh, my impression in, in meeting and talking to people at the conference is uh, they have this understanding that it's a very broad definition and their experience is that there are small pockets of really interesting activity going on in universities, supported often by lone champions. And the big question is, well, two questions, how can we scale that activity up so that it involves more of the organization? I suppose you hint at another question, should we scale it up? Should we be trying to do that? Um, and I really like the fact that you then took us to questioning, uh, and I think that the 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 topic leads you very quickly to this. Why do we have universities? What's their purpose? How are they structured? How are they funded? What were they like? What are they like now? But what should they be like in the future? Mm -hmm. And this seems to me very exciting because it really is bringing the whole concept of innovation into the very idea of higher education itself. So could you say whether you think it, this is leading us to a, a, a rethinking of, of higher education? And my experience as well is that this is the debate that's going on all over the world, not just in the UK. I've been focused on rethinking the entrepreneurial universe, but it's really think, rethinking the, uni the university per se. But, but I, think, um, I think that needs to be seen in the context that the university hasn't ever been static, really. Uh, you know, we, we have this, perhaps this notion that well, amongst some people that, oh, this, this awful notion of entrepreneurial universities, but entrepreneurs about traditional research. Well, that's a very narrow, short window in the life of universities. If you trace it back over hundreds of years, then the, the role of university has changed. Uh, if it does, uh, you, you may be aware of an article that Ben Martin did uh, back in 2012. Uh, ben Martin is at Sussex University in the UK and uh, is editor of research policy. It's a very stimulating article on on what the nature of the university is. And he traces through how, how universities have always been changing. So it's a myth that universities have always been this research-oriented ivory tower. And once we get away from that, then reevaluating higher education and universities kind of naturally opens out. And we say, well, we're not necessarily kind of moving away from it and throwing it in the bin, nor are we necessarily going back to what it was 300 years ago but actually it opens up new opportunities to say, well, let's build on that legacy. What's good from it? But actually, what do we need to, to bring in that can actually enhance that? I think one, so there's a kind of this danger of saying, well, oh, entrepreneurship is nasty thing. 
on the one hand, and on the other hand, oh, these traditional universities are nasty on the other. Uh, let's get rid of them. Uh, and I think both camps are, are kind of quite um, naive, if not dangerous, uh, because I think there are benefits to create something that, or to synthesize something from that is actually quite different, but it actually can enhance the role uh, of universities and academics uh, as we go into the future. Yeah. Okay, we've got time for just one last quick question. Uh, what I have seen, that at least is the few times that I have seen the Science Park mentioned in, in any presentation in this conference along the days. Just myself, yesterday during the, the, the presentations, we were talking about that. What do you think why Science Parks are not seen as a very good resource, as an ex, let's say, the rotor of the triple helix to connect university industry and government? also society, and it's only seen like uh, something marginal because I see that universities are building new mechanisms to promote entrepreneurship and the connection with the industry. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I can claim that I, I did have the word science park on one slide. So, uh, so uh, mea non culpa. Um, and, and I did do some work on science park incubators um, in Spain recently. So, uh, you know, I'm interested in that area. I, I think... Um, I think one of the issues is perhaps thinking about how one can better connect up some science parks to, to universities. So in terms of that diagram I had, going from pre-accelerators to accelerators and incubators, I think as I see things evolving, I think there's, there's a, a connection to be made, a process to, as part of that, to link in these new forms of entrepreneurship within universities to science parks and to think about, well, at what stage do, does the role of science parks come in? Do, can, do science parks come in at a later stage when these things are fully formed? Or should science parks play more of an accelerator role at the early stage? So there's kind of the issue of where you come into the process and what does that imply about the kind of expertise you need in the science park? You know, because on one hand, some science parks are basically office spaces. Some of them are more um, managed, if you like, or have expertise in them. And I think, you know, there's this var there is this variation between science parks. There are some university science parks that, that have a, may have a particular role to play, but maybe in, in this new environment, there are some new things that need to be, uh, to need to be developed that, that, that they can actually play more than a, just... Um, an office space role. Uh, and then there's also the other thing with science parks, I guess, is this exit part of it. You know, what, what happens with, on the one hand, you, tr you, you want in uh, ventures there to fill the space, but actually, at what point should they be leaving the science park to move on? Because that may create uh, resources and space to bring on new ones. So, as I would say, those, for my mind, those are the kind of challenges or opportunities, if you want to put it that way, for science parks in, in, this, in this brave new world here. Okay, fantastic. I think that's all the time we've got for questions. Now, Mike, yesterday the, uh, the uh, keynote speaker received a hug um, as a form of thanks, but I'm going to give offer you my hand, so thank you very much. <laughs> if you could please all help me thanking Mike, <laughs> Professor Mike Wright. Thank you. <laughs> Pleasure.